brief introduction about yourself. Sir, I am Colonel Mukuldev. In 1988, I was commissioned into the Regiment of Artillery. I served in artillery for good about 10 years, or rather more than that. I participated in Op Vijay. I was actively involved in Op Vijay. And uh, since I was a law graduate, subsequently I changed over to Jag branch. And uh, thereafter, I have recently retired from Jag branch after putting in more than 20 years of judicial service. Now I'm in full-time litigation. I run my own law firm with the name of DM Juris Consultants. And that's it I can say about me. Uh, good, that's interesting. Now, in uh, this lecture, we will be covering uh, litigation which is there relating to military law. Now, the litigation, as you know, can be by the service personnel, ex-servicemen, their next of kin, and it is against the Ministry of Defense. There are also cases where Ministry of Defense goes in either as an appeal or in some other matter for some other relief. So what is your experience? Say, firstly, at the level of Armed Forces Tribunal, what advice would you like to give to the law graduates who want to make a profession in litigation, working as an advocate uh, before the AFT benches. I would like to listen and benefit from your comments with regard to that. So firstly, I would cover that AFT, creation of AFT rather was a right step. After the judgment of Lieutenant Colonel PPS Bedi in 1982, there was a need felt by the Honorable Supreme Court that there is no forum for appeal against any of the court martials or against any of the disciplinary awards to the service personnel. So after about 26 years, in 2007, Armed Forces Act came into existence, wherein a platform for appeal was given to the serving personnel as well as for the ex-servicemen. It started functioning effectively from 2008 Initially, 22 benches were established. Now, slowly, slowly, more benches are being added to it. Now, as regards to practicing in AFT is concerned for the young law graduates, first and the foremost requirement for these people would be that they have to make themselves fully abreast, firstly, with the Army Act and Army rules, the regulations, and the law related to the armed forces. Though it is not very difficult, but there are certain uh, peculiar things about the Army Act and Army, law, uh, Army rules. That is, CRPC is not applicable to a larger extent on armed forces uh, or military law. And for that, we have got our own rules. Uh, I will uh, take you Sir. from there, particularly with regard to litigation, because in earlier lectures, we have already covered Sir. adequately about military law provisions. Sir. Now we are into practice and application of those laws Sir. and rules with regard to AFT. So please come on that. First and the foremost requirement would be to uh, make myself aware about the complete provisions yes. of the AFT Act. Very much so. And uh, I have to relate the two things, that is section 14 and 15 of AFT Act, wherein there is an appeal provision, yes. there is an appellate provision to that. And the advocate whosoever takes up the job of any service personnel or for the ESM for their grievances has to keep in mind that he has to be fully aware of the different provisions existing for the armed forces vis-a-vis -vis the laws in the civil cases. To that extent, the format is entirely different. There is a set format which is being used in AFT cases. It appears till now that the disposal in AFT is faster than what was there earlier in high courts, wherein only writ jurisdiction was available. So that uh, I would say that laxity which used to be existing in high court cases is not there in AFT. AFT is pretty faster in disposal of the cases in case the litigant as well as the uh, advocate of the litigant is proactive. If the case is filed after uh, thoughtful research 
and all the uh, connected policies oblique the annexures are connect, uh, attached to the petition properly, then I don't think so there should be a problem in early or a speedy disposal of AFT cases. AFT has got certain inherent drawbacks, but still I would say that it is much more faster than what used to be the system earlier. Would you like to throw a little more light and give example when you said that if the advocate is proactive, what exactly do you mean? Sir, One I would… thing you, you mentioned that if he has filed or annexures correctly, that's fine. Is there any other part of being proactive that you have in mind? I would say that in case a reply is not being filed by the government for whatsoever reasons in the given time frame, he must bring it out to the notice of the AFT. AFT, as I said, is quite helpful to the service personnel as well as to the ex servicemen And uh, the advocate should ensure that the least time is given to the respondents or the prescribed okay. time to file the reply. Right. Similarly, when the time comes for filing a rejoinder, he should quickly file the rejoinder and get a date earmarked for the final arguments. Okay. So that is what my point. Right. Fine. Thanks. Now, the same situation is there. Uh, whether uh, it, the matter is before the principal bench or one of the regional benches or do you find some difference in approach? Sir, I find that the regional benches, firstly, they are not all that heavily workloaded the way the principal bench here is in Delhi. If the regional benches are working properly with the uh, assigned judicial member and the administrative member, then the, I have seen the cases getting over in three months to six months in a time period. But in principal bench, sometimes it gets delayed. Okay. Is uh, there, apart from this proactive element that you said, then you laid emphasis on all annexures being there, is there any other advice that you would like to give to an advocate who is setting up his practice before AFT? Except or is it generally fine? It's generally fine. Okay. Now, what uh, is your uh, experience? Uh, when cases are either filed or defended by government, because the government also has the advocates. So, what? how is their performance? Is it up to the, the, up to the mark or you have found that there is some laxity? If so, what is that laxity? Definitely, sir, there is a laxity on the part of the government. Firstly, there is a two-pronged uh, approach. First, there is an armed forces uh, OIC legal cell who receives the copy, then he assigns the same to, the, to a government council and here lies the problem. The government councils of late who are being appointed as government council by Ministry of Law and Justice because it is their job. Most of the time, I personally found that they were not up to the mark as far as their knowledge of military law is concerned. As OIC legal myself for three years, I have seen that Irrespective of howsoever uh, uh, number of times we may brief a government council, they still used to falter. There are some very good government councils also, but the question remains how long we can rely on only one council or two councils. We have to evenly spread the butter on the bread. It cannot happen that only two uh, councils or three councils are working and rest are not there. I used to uh, divide them category-wise that somebody is for the particular uh, pension matters or somebody is for career prospect matters, but still they were found wanting on so many aspects. So government, while choosing such government councils, must carry out some more scrutiny before they are assigned such jobs. Uh, I would like to be a little more specific in this. Uh, the deficiency on part of the government panel councils is it because of their lack of understanding of military law or they do not devote enough time to go through the papers uh, or perhaps their uh, lack of interest because of uh, the financial benefits which they get? What could be the reason or maybe more than one of these? Sir, as far as the financial benefits are concerned firstly, no, I don't agree to this aspect. They get adequately paid by the government. Yes, their interest level is low. Knowledge is very, very shallow on the government, uh, on the armed forces matters. We can pep up their knowledge by regularly briefing them, by uh, uh, forcing somebody to understand as to what the issue of law or the facts of the case is. But still, they devote much lesser time. 
in armed forces matters because they know they are going to be here for two years or three years of period and then they are going to practice in uh, civil like they were practicing earlier. So they don't give that much of time. It's perhaps lack of interest. Lack of, lack yes, of interest. Yes. Neglect. Yes. Right. Yes. Now this was the position uh, in matters relating to AFT. Do you find that there is uh, any difference in the matters that are there with the high courts? Sir, I would say high courts uh, things are little better. Firstly, the advocates who are practicing there since ages, they are still with the high court only. They have dealt with our armed forces matters earlier. So they are a little better informed and more practiced in such matters than the councils who have come to AFT from the government side. Okay. That is one. Secondly, the experience of high court judges I find to be much more than our armed forces tribunal benches wherein there is one judicial member and one uh, administrative, administrative member okay. and that judicial member may have may or may not have dealt with armed forces cases he may have dealt with service matters but service matters vis-a-vis -vis armed forces matter there is a difference okay right uh, thank you